really pleased you could make it now. It was nice talking to you on the telephone. That's and I'm glad you had a good talk with my friend Margaret and uh, so forth. And uh, in the audience, welcome, welcome very much to Conversations. The guest for this program is Glenn Phillips, and you can see on the screen, he's the executive director of the New York City Audubon. I'm not sure I wanted to add society or something, but it's New York City Audubon. And he's a person that's concerned with ecology and uh, Audubon uh, as a person, I imagine. And Glenn, welcome very, very much to Conversations. It's a pleasure to be here. As I indicated to you, could you share your background? Born and raised and educated, and then we're going to start talking about ecology and other things, but could you share your own background, please? Sure, sure. I w was born in New Haven, Connecticut, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, raised in California, uh, in the suburbs of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there I discovered nature as a very young child and, mm -hmm. and started, I, sometimes I say I started my career in in the environment when I was eight years old, mm -hmm. uh, carrying my traveling collection of, of snakes and lizards that I had, had captured and kept as pets and bringing them to other schools. So it wasn't like you were in an inner city environment. You, yeah. were, you had a little fields and streams. We and lived stuff at the around. end of the, the end Where of the development. Where exactly? Where? Livermore. It's Livermore, it's about, that way. It's about 60 miles east of San Francisco. Mill Valley, there's a place. There's Bo yeah, that's Bo north. Bo Bolinas, there's a place out there. That's there. north. This yeah. is east, so east, east of San Francisco. Oh, you're going east? Of down Near Oakland or Pass or further, fur, further fur out, further out. It's where the Altamont Pass is. Okay, which, which is of course fa infamous for uh, certain Rolling rock concert. Rolling Stones, yeah, and uh. maybe famous today as the home of the Altamont Wind Farms. Which, okay, uh, oh really? They those, are. Yeah. Okay, that's a lot of wind coming up there. Yep. I remember being out there in August one time when in San Francisco. I was going to freeze to death. It was so cold. I, <laughs> it's a strange kind of climatic situation. But you became. What was your family background like, or who were your dad and mom and that? Well, my father is. A scientist. He is. Okay. Yes. In what? what? In, he's a physicist. Physicist. And okay. my mother uh, was an English teacher. Mm -hmm. She's now uh, now retired. They're both retired. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so it's sort of no surprise that I'm a science educator. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. In he he was a uh, educator or was he in industry or? Oh uh, no. He he was a research physicist. Okay. He uh -huh. Worked with you know smashing bits of atoms together to right. see what happens in the world. So the, uh, the, de the, the conversation around the dinner table was, 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 uh, was intellectually oriented, somewhat socially concerned, and that kind absolutely. of thing, encouraging, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah, and, very, right. And, and very, both my parents are very interested in nature, so okay. that they, from, the, from the youngest age, they uh -huh. brought me into nature uh, and uh, encouraged my love of nature and, uh, and really nurtured that in me so that I would end up running an Audubon Society. I think my parents will be surpri were surprised when I ended up in New York City. Um, mm -hmm. Their nature boy ended up in, you know, in the biggest Gotham city in the city, US, the I biggest guess. city. But I, we walk, we took our dog for a walk one day when I first knew, it was where I am now, and we walked over to um, the Javits Center. We went down some steps. We had the dog, and she said, "Well, here we are." And I said, "Well, where the heck are we?" And because I looked around, there was a parking lot, and there was a little ribbon of dirt about that wide, right? Like that, and and the dog was going, and he could dig a little bit in the <laughs> dirt. And we looked back all the way to where we live. It was totally nothing but asphalt and cement. You know, it, it dawned on me just how far you are from nature here in New York City. And, and, and it was pathetic. The well, poor dog had to go dig a little bit of dirt. You but know? there is so much nature in the city. I uh, that's true. Still, that I think is that true. most most New Yorkers probably don't even realize mm -hmm. that there are over 300 species of birds. That, that visit that right? New York. That's right. You sent me an email. Thank you for that. Yeah, really. Okay. Over 300 species, and 140 of those are are, are threatened or species or species of, of conservation concern. Uh -huh. So it's not just that there are lots of common birds in New York City. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, people know pigeons and mm -hmm. and maybe they know a starling or a house sparrow. Those mm -hmm. are birds yeah. we see every day. But yeah. there are there are birds like peregrine falcons. They're there are beautiful. bald eagles in yeah. New York City. Yeah. But you didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't <laughs> know that at all. Bald eagle. Bald or nest here? They don't nest here, but they, 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 they fly over. Or? Well, they winter on the lower Hudson, a little you, mostly north of the city. But, okay. But yeah. when the weather conditions are right and there's ice on the Hudson mm -hmm. in the winter, they they come down to to check out our shores. It's good mm -hmm. fishing. And yeah. That's you know the Hudson River is is vastly improved from what it was. It is. Thank 40 you, years Mr. Ago. Clearwater and Mr. Yeah. Pete Seeger. He's been a great one for clearing that up. The shatter back, I understand. Yeah. As I understand, and you know most of the fish. Species in the river are doing well. Not all of them. The sturgeon mm -hmm. are still, you know, a little shaky. Uh -huh. uh, but um, 
but with protection and with the water getting cleaned up, yeah. um, I think that they're, they're recovering. And so that's, that also helps all the other species as well. It's very encouraging. Now, you went on to, uh, you, you studied at, uh, where you went to your education, formal education, I mean, outside well, I, of the home. Outside of the home. Well, That's I, really important, the home yes, setting, it is. I think. It, yeah. it is. I, I think yeah. I le certainly learned as much outside of my formal education as I did in it. Uh, and, but, and, and the appreciation of intellectual inquiry and everything is really important to have part of the context within which you're raised, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I went, to, uh, I went to Harvard to study biology. You went that, as an undergrad? As an undergraduate. I was thinking, I was, I, when, I, when I entered school, when I entered college, I thought, oh, I'm gonna be, I, I'm gonna be a research plant ecologist. I wanna study you were in the already, rainforest. You were already focused on ecology from when you were eight. Oh, yes. In nature. Oh, yes, You picked absolutely. up on that seriously. Everybody has a feel for that at that age, I think more or less and everything, but you were really serious about it. I was it. serious. I uh -huh. knew this was what I wanted to do and mm -hmm. I got, I got, I, 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 as a sophomore in college, I was taking graduate courses and working in the, the, the botany research lab and I realized, wait a second, this isn't what I want to do with my life. I love plants, I love nature, but, but science research is frankly a little tedious. I was spending hours every evening weighing seeds one by one to look at, at, at the differences of, of, of seed timing and size and in, in, in how plants would do, would do competitively with each other. And it was, uh, it was a little esoteric. And I okay. thought, I want to make, I, I, I want to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and while the science is really important and I value it and, and I understand how we need it, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't how I was meant to change the world. I'm wondering if, uh, if it relates to education in general. I, w I was a great fan of Bucky Fuller, who was a comprehensivist, and I took a field in my work in geography because it has large patterns that you're looking, up, looking at. You can do anything in the name of geography, physical, cultural, and that sort of thing, so that you have a chance to be able to look at things in a very large, I thought there ought to be a department at a university of everything. <laughs> because in a very real sense, everything is connected. Everything, ecology, we think in terms of nature, but the whole system of life on this planet, Gaia, they have this idea of Gaia now. Uh, sure. Uh, I, you know, that, that's a reality, and I think the youth are, and human consciousness is very good at pattern recognizing, but the educational thing seems to go into specialization. And uh, I wonder what you think, like counting seeds in the laboratory. Right. Oh, well, I think mm. that that is that was what I realized was that 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 the that academic science was going to take me down narrower and narrower paths. And, and you were. I wanted to look big and wide and look at big patterns and look at at the whole world uh -huh. and and not feel like I had to had to be that focused on on one corner of the universe thank you very much and were you uh, what about uh, if I may uh, I think my I, sometimes I think my favorite people in the world are five-year-olds five-year-olds are so <laughs> honest and they're so curious and they I are know, indeed in the name of uh, education I'm not so sure but when you were younger you were eight you took interest you mentioned that age but you were interested in that like in junior high and high school were you following Absolutely. along that line of nature and particularly uh, the ecology yeah. or you could see ecology in your future. Right? I, I, I knew that, that nature was in my future. Okay. I, mean, yeah. I, I would, I, my, my mother ran a summer camp and I led all the nature activities mm -hmm. when I, this was when I was in middle school and in high school I, I worked at uh, the Wente Scout Reservation and, uh -huh. and, and ran the nature um, merit badge area. Okay. And I, I mean it was, you know, it was of little doubt. You were but, destined. Exactly. I like, knew that was where like I was Lawrence headed. of Arabia. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You were, okay, that's really good and everything like that. I wonder if I could ask you another question. We want to get down to the society and everything, Audubon. Uh, um, you're not, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're interested in ecology, you're interested in nature, in a certain sense, you know, Rousseau and that kind of thing, or you could say, what about human processes, politics, economics, uh, the other aspects of human culture? Uh, if you're interested in, there's an interface between them, of course, right. but and you, nature, but you are focusing on nature as opposed to human cultural things? 
or well, I, is there a necessary separation, or do we not have to bridge the gap between them? We must bridge the gap okay, between thank them. You. If we if we don't, we mm -hmm. won't have any nature left. So you really think? That? I really think so. We I have think the ability to destroy nature. Absolutely. Okay. And we're doing it, you know, inch by inch. You think so? Yes, uh, I do. I you do. like uh, Rachel Carlson? Yes. The Silent Spring. I think that we have come a long way uh, since then. It's, okay. You know, the, yeah. the, you know, Earth Day is about to celebrate 40, 40 years. 40 days, years in the wilderness. Yeah. Like and Moses. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's a challenge. Or public access television got started 40 years 40 ago. 40 years too. ago. Well, yeah, right. so a lot of good things happened. It was a major break ago. point, in my view. I was born point. about then. So. Okay. Well, that's a See? major <laughs> event. I had a friend, of, one of our producers here, uh, John and the Kirsten, God bless them, they're really creative, brilliant. She's just about to give birth any day now, so everybody's waiting. It's a big breakthrough moment always, you know, always. the birthing process. Yeah. The, I, I really think that 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 there are there are, there are so many threats to our environment. Okay. And that if we aren't working to to fix them, mm -hmm. and that the solutions rely, lie at that interface of people and nature. Mm -hmm. And so, because we have to make decisions about how we use our resources around us. Right. And if we're not making wise decisions, our children and grandchildren will suffer for it. Um, yes, that would be correct. And uh, the, 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 the man milieu relationship was part of geography, which I did. There was a, there was a grand book, it Man's Role in Changing the Face of the Earth was a book where they had man milieu relationships and that sort of thing. And it's really important, but to think that we could um, destroy nature, I don't, you really think that's possible? Let me ask you another question, even though you're in ecology. Mm -hmm. Ecology very close, if I may suggest, to uh, my thoughts in, uh, in terms of geography. But um, we, mankind has the ability to extend their consciousness and make the world different in a way that most creatures do not have, although they do. They do just without knowing it, but beavers build dams and birds build nests and that sort of thing. But mankind really can, and we reach a point where we have an incredible capability, technological extension of consciousness, uh, much of which has been applied to war making between ourselves and our various tribes and so forth. Mm -hmm. Are you, without, let's just get past it quick and get back to nature, but are you optimistic for the human prospect now? Or I am. What is your feeling I, about that? I am that? very optimistic. You I are? Think, okay. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do feel like there is a collective understanding mm -hmm. that, that we, uh, we are our planet. Mm -hmm. I think that, that mm -hmm. the, the, the rise of understanding of the, the need to deal with global warming and climate change, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not like, this is not a new idea. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. can remember being a child and hearing scientists say, this is gonna be a problem, we need to deal with it. Yeah. And most people not listening. You know, right. Today, I don't think anybody's not listening. There may okay. be some people unwilling to make the changes that need to happen. Happen, uh -huh. but everybody is aware that it's happening. Okay. Do you take any heart in, uh, did you ever cotton on to Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, or not? Maybe that doesn't ring a bell. Oh, uh, I, I know who who he was and yeah. what his work was, and uh, he's, he's you know, certainly inspirational. I, 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 I'm not saying I'm well versed in his yeah, work, right. but I... I but he, 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 he was a design scientist, he was a comprehensive, he was a design scientist, and he would design, like for instance, he did the geodesic dome, mm -hmm. which is the most efficient way to enclose space in terms mm -hmm. of weight and so forth, and it's very, and he used to have a, a term, ephemeralization, that is where you can do more with less. That if we look back through history, the satanic mills of England and, you know, uh, that we've raped the planet in order to gain certain industrial advantages and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And I wonder if you think through design and through the use of emerging technology, the computer comes to mind where it used to be a room the size of this full of vacuum tubes to get what you get on a chip that goes through the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So there's advantage that we can, in a certain sense, have technolo technology is not the enemy of the ecology, or do we? Do you think that? Or do we think that mankind is a plague upon the earth or the uh, biological process? Or how do we deal with that big issue between nature or the rest of the environment and mankind as a force of, of qualitative transformative power? 
Well, I think we need to learn how to live more lightly on our planet. Lightly, we, okay. And, and I think there is a lot of movement in that direction. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I, I, I was <coughs> just at, you know, at Home Depot in the other day, and there yeah. was a, a whole new line of green cleaning products being showcased. And, you know, it's, peep, green is, is in right now. Okay. Um, and I think that, that you know, buildings, you know, developers in New uh -huh. York City today are scrambling to produce, you know, new LEED certified buildings so that they are LEED, lead certified. Lead, LEED, what does that mean? Leadership lead. in Energy and Efficiency Oh, design. I've not heard that. That's, yeah, it's, okay, a, uh -huh. it's a program of the U.S. Green Building Council that that certifies buildings as being lighter on our planet. Lighter, yes. lighter footprint. A lighter footprint, so that means they use less energy, they use less water, the materials haven't been shipped as far. Uh -huh. that, um, oh, interesting, local then, yeah, it's uh, encouraged. All of the good things that yeah. you can do to make, to, if you're gonna build a building, uh -huh. that, that ways that you can do it that will have less of an impact on our planet. And they're really, it's, you know, we've been, we've been working yeah. with the U.S. Green Building Council because their focus so far has been primarily on this energy and water issue. And, you know, there is also a wildlife issue that we're concerned about. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. we'll, that, you know, that buildings also can directly and indirectly hurt wildlife. And so we, we're, we're working with them to make sure that future editions of the standards include bird friendliness as uh, as something. I mean, it's you know, it's, it seems yeah, yeah, it seems yeah. awful to me that a, that a lead cert, platinum lead certified building, mm -hmm. so that's the you know, the the best building for the environment, mm -hmm. could could have that certification and and kill hundreds of birds every year as they migrate by. I don't quite understand because we're in the pathway of their migratory path. Yeah, and, and and birds okay. don't see glass. No. So they when so glass buildings and one of the things that LEED encourages building developers to do is to use more glass because then you need less electric light. That's right. It's also easier yeah. for automated construction techniques too. Yeah. And so so but the more glass you use, the more deadly the building is for birds. Mm -hmm. And so you know we have there's a building not far from here that was recently retrofitted to stop, but was killing 300 birds every every season, every season twice a year. You know, between two <coughs> and six million birds mm -hmm. fly through New York City on their way to and from their their wintering grounds in the south, uh, on their way up north, mm -hmm. uh, and and they have to any bird that's that's headed to the northeastern United States, to New England or mm -hmm. to to Canada, has to fly through New York City. And they've been doing that for thousands of years, perhaps. Tens of thousands of years, tens at least. Of I mean, the, of the glaciers years. retreated from here 10, between 000, 10 and 12,000 years yeah. ago. Uh -huh. So We have a moraine that goes right through here. Right yeah. through, yeah. Yeah, right through Manhattan, I think, yeah. That's really interesting. So you got that pattern there, and then along comes man. And man can have such a role in shaping the face of the earth with all of his architecture and all of his footprint, as you say. Now, if you look at if you look at New York Harbor, New, mm -hmm. when, when you know when Henry Hudson sailed into New York Harbor, mm -hmm. low yeah. those many years ago, uh -huh. he found this incredibly rich system filled with wetlands. This, yeah, okay, this was a place yeah. of wetlands. Salt yeah. marshes uh -huh. were as far as the eye could see. Right. And filled with fish and game and birds. He couldn't believe how rich this, this place was when uh -huh. he saw it. Because he came from Europe that was somewhat developed. Already. Along the lines of industrialization, which was over the horizon for humanity. No. The Industrial Revolution was coming. Yeah, and well, uh -huh. so today there's less, only a few percent of the wetlands remain. Mm -hmm. We have taken what was a soft, gentle shoreline mm -hmm. and put hard walls all around it mm -hmm. all right, and that changes the whole system did they have to do that in order for let's say the great ocean liners had to have a place to do mooring yes, exactly and so there it was no way that we could not do that uh, uh, or we couldn't you, you know what I'm saying is right. that that interface but between some the of two. it was a, was need and some of it was value because really until very recently you know even in the 1970s New mm -hmm. York City was filling in wetlands the people didn't value them they were wastelands that that yeah. were good for garbage dumps and for filling in and they that got between you and the water that you needed to use to mm -hmm. get your product somewhere else yes uh -huh. and <coughs> and so we filled in the wetlands and hardened our shorelines and now 
you mm -hmm. know, centuries later, mm -hmm. as our climate begins to change, mm -hmm. all of those those changes that we've made to our harbor mm -hmm. make New York City incredibly vulnerable. Yeah. Because those wetlands were our buffer, our protection from storm surges, from from severe yeah. tides, from sea level rise, and as as we experience over the next 300 years, uh -huh. uh, right, significant so. changes, it's, yeah. it will, we're going to have to deal with it. And we're going to have to think of really clever ways to solve a problem that is of our own making. Our own making, man, man, mankind's making. Beavers do make dams, don't they? And they dam up a thing that might be upsetting to another creature that lived in an environment that's changed by the fact that dam exists. And there's a lot of things. Honeybees go around doing all kinds of cross-pollinization. The, the path of nature, Rousseau, Rousseau talked about the beauty of nature. Is nature, is mankind a blot upon the world? Or how does mankind fit in? And then how do we relate to those two things? And then what are the hopes for there being a, a and let, let's think instead of 300 years, let's think 1,000 years. Then we're not going to blow it up, which is a danger now. Yes. And that sort of thing. But we could pass 1,000 years from now um, through design and through uh, maybe design of a whole lot of different things, economic institutions and the ability for people not to be all agglomerated in one place, urban, that we had to do with the industrial. There are changes that will come from the social order that might make possible for us to live easier and more connected lives through technology, communications or something, but well, we can look ahead. Or do we just uh, a curse on mankind because they're and they just had that fellow landed the airplane in the uh, Hudson River. He was there right. because the airplane had been fouled by geese. Yeah. And then they think they treated the geese very badly, but those geese had been nesting there for hundreds of years. And the relationship, and they packed them off somewhere. And they didn't have any thought about the, the rights of the geese or the lesser creatures, if they're seen that way, from an egoistic kind of perch that humanity sits upon and say, the hell with all those creatures, we're going to go full steam forward so I can have everything that I want, including a swimming pool full of diamonds or some <laughs> such nonsense, you know? Well, I, I think you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. I mm. think that people are, you know, it, are interesting in that we have the capacity to understand what we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, self-reflective consciousness. Right, and so, yeah. so if, we, if we live up to the potential of that capacity, yes. that then I see in a thousand years or two thousand years or 10,000 years, I see that, that, that humans are the sort of the exemplification of nature, right? I mean, humans are, you know, are animals. We are yeah. animals, we are nature. It's all interconnected. And so, yeah. and we depend on ecosystem services from, from our environment. Oh, humans, yeah. you know, if, if, if we, you know, paved over the entire planet, we would disappear and, and we know that. And so we, there, we, we, there's reason for us to choose a different path than our own extermination. Um, and so I, I, I believe that, that we are, humans aren't a blot on the planet. I mean, we are the future of our planet, mm -hmm. and we have a responsibility to ourselves mm -hmm. as the future of this planet to, to keep as much of the wonderful things of our planet uh, uh, with us into our future as we can. In your definition of the wonderful is the natural. So you said well, it was not beautiful just when Henry things. Hudson came here, but the Empire State Building isn't, it's or also Art Deco, beautiful. or, or Van Gogh, or all these things are also part of it. But there, are, Rousseau thought a noble savage, and they thought people are living in the, you have to go back into history, and there's an in march of history, industrialization, post-industrial civilization, evolution of consciousness. Maybe we're coming to a new relationship at the end of uh, some sort of a time scale that began when first we appeared, that kind of thing. But you have that idea. I mean, we're getting far afield, and the hell of it is, <laughs> is you did all your science. You, get, you did all your science yeah. uh, degree in, in ecology then, mm -hmm. and everything, and then you've come to be, how long have you been, uh, and the problem is not enough time, because all of these things are things we could go down, particularly in a pattern way. Yeah. And uh, how, how, you, you took a degree in ecology, is that it? Yes. They have that degree now. Yeah. Yeah. What is that within biology? Yes, the science? Yeah, it's, a, it's a biology. And then you do biology? Yeah. Do you have to do, okay, you don't have to do physics. You have well, to you have to chemistry. do a little bit of physics. You have to do a little bit of chemistry. <laughs> you have to do a lot of biology. Yeah. You have to start. You have to look at 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 patterns. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's about sort of understanding 
I think the the understanding patterns and change, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I think those are those are difficult things to yeah. understand. Yeah, right. Oh. And so it's I mean it's an interesting perspective even in conservation because as a conservationist, you know, it, it's it's somewhat my job to protect things. But as Con an e as an ecologist, yeah. I say, but things are always changing. You see yourself as a conservationist or an ecologist, and what's the difference? Well, I I, I work professionally as a conservationist. Conservationist. You want to conserve the wetlands, conserve the natural order. Yes, exactly. Against the encroachment of humanity's footprint. Exactly. Okay. As an ecologist. So that puts you in a particular position, right. yeah. But as an ecologist, mm -hmm. I see that I see change. Mm -hmm. You know, it, and, and so I, I often feel sort of when I look at Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. it's a, it's an old former airstrip. Yeah. And it's it over the years it was sort of re reverted into this wild grassland state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it turns out in New York City grasslands are a temporary phase and that grasslands get replaced by shrublands which get replaced by forests. Yeah, they call it climax vegetation, natural vegetation right, it's a, much, it's under certain it's a, climatic situations. Right, but grassland in New York City mm -hmm. grasslands yeah. are an early successional phase, we mm -hmm. call that. Mm -hmm. It's an early it'll get it'll get replaced by something else later. Okay. Uh -huh. So should we be investing time and money and energy to keep this grassland grassland or should it become a shrubland or a forest and serve those species that depend on forests? What energy does it take to keep it be a grassland? Well, you have to keep mowing it or burning it. Uh -huh. uh, it doesn't, it, it left to its own devices, it will go from grassland to shrubland so to forest. So if we, we have, a, in geography, you have a climatic map of the world is the best, the best mental map to have in your mind for trying to understand the world. And you can almost superimpose the natural vegetation on top of the climate. Yep. So it's a thing that is there. It's, you have to also know a little bit about the soils too. Yeah, right. To, right sure. There are actually historically, there's the Hempstead Plain, which was a, a, a prairie piece mm -hmm. um, on Long Island. It's, there's only a teeny tiny bit of it left. Most people don't even know it existed. Yeah. Um, we used to have a, 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 a kind of a, a heath hen. It was a, related to the sage grass of the West, uh -huh. um, a prairie chicken and mm -hmm. that, yeah, that, prairie, lived, that, yeah. that lived on Long Island uh -huh. um, in the Hempstead Plain. Mm. And also on places like Martha's Vineyard and, and Nantucket and mm -hmm. on Cape Cod, and was you know wiped out, was like completely extinct. Yeah, they they couldn't. Uh -huh. the, the grasslands of the, the richest soils, uh, is it Charnazem or Podzil? I'm not sure. The soils of Illinois were not able to be available to us until we get the steel plow. They couldn't cut through no. those. They couldn't do it. So the advance of that is there. Trouble is, it's too darn interesting. <laughs> Audubon <laughs> Society, or what do you call it? New York Audubon. We call it New York City Audubon. There yeah. There are a lot of there's there's a lot of Audubon. Audubon, of course, the famous uh, uh, artist. Yeah. Artist John James Audubon, a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. For those of many people don't know that, mm -hmm. that he is buried here in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, he lived um, uptown, and uh, and that was where he he did a lot of his painting earlier mm -hmm. when he was uh, exploring what is now the United States. Yeah, American uh, Experience had a wonderful one-hour documentary yeah. on last week about him. It was he's really a, good, yeah. He, he's, a, he's an extraordinary man. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of, uh, people today often sort of undervalue his paintings, mm -hmm. I think, because, you know, we've, We've come a long way. You know, a, a wildlife painter today mm -hmm. has binoculars and a camera, mm -hmm. and they can really capture a moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, Audubon had he had to shoot the birds. That was the only way he could I get know. those details. I was know. if he is, his, he didn't couldn't look. And they're binoculars. so authentic. They're so authentic to the reality that he was able to do. Great what what most people don't know about mm -hmm. him was that he was an incredible observer of nature, and okay. that, that for every painting, he spent hours and hours in the field observing birds, uh -huh. learning about their habits and behaviors, right. and he documented all of every, th every bird. Yeah. So in addition to the paintings, there mm -hmm. was also text that went with each one. Mm -hmm. and his wife, um, Lucy, was also his editor and mm -hmm. worked with him on the text, and so it was a family um, uh -huh. process to get that. Uh, his sons worked on some of the works as well. Uh -huh. they were, it was really a, 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 an important uh, you know, Activity to, to create this Birds of America, yeah, and it was I mean it was really extraordinary. First first of all to document to try to yes, document every right. species in America. They, they they started off the documentary with him where they were uh, they were going to melt down some lithographs or something of birds, and he was just very young and he made a super effort to save 
the ones that were, and then he recognized how important it was that we have a record of the of, of the birds, and then set off on his career. You know, we Th can, that's in the documentary. Yeah. The great, the well, great well, you know, um, experience. You know, the the Audubon societies, and there are many of them all I over sure. the United States. Uh, you know, we take our name from from John James Audubon yeah. mm -hmm. and his work, um, but it, some of that comes from a student of his widows. He, mm. John had passed away before um, George Bird Grinnell was um, was a young man and, uh. and learned from 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 Lucy Audubon. She was his his teacher. They uh. called her Grandma, uh. Uh, and and he learned about nature, learned to, to love nature and yeah. care about birds. Uh -huh. And around the, the, the turn of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th century, he was very active in protecting birds. And he launched the first Audubon Society for the Protection of Birds right okay. here in New York City. Okay. Um, uh -huh. And, uh, you know, over 100 years later, there are hundreds of Audubon Societies. Yes. Many of us, like New York City Audubon, are affiliated with the National Audubon Society, which has its headquarters here in New York City. It's head headquarters it's here headquarters also. Here. Uh, and and he, he lived here in New York. Uh, Audubon do, lived do here. Do we have a, a landmark building to mark that or anything? Like we, we do with don't. Teddy the Roosevelt? building where he we lived have, is think. gone. It's, yeah. it's long oh, gone. Oh, okay, but yeah, but yeah. the cemetery in which he's buried is still here. Okay, where? Uh, it's up at uh, by it's, the area is called, called Audubon Terrace these days. Yeah, but where? I mean, where, where uptown, uptown, midtown, uptown. in Manhattan. In Manhattan. Way up in uh, top of uh, of Manhattan, almost yes. into the Bronx, or no, it's not quite that far up. Okay. It's, but it's north of the George Washington. Bridge. Okay, and that's. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> very good. Well, listen, and one of the things we have, again, the problem is not enough time, the subject's so inherently so interesting, and the work you do, <coughs> excuse me, is really very good, but you brought in a DVD with some uh, thing. Maybe you could, as we say in the business, set it up for us, sure. what it is, and then we'll, we'll, let's play that, and I just remind the audience, again, we're talking to um, the executive director of the New York City Autobahn, but could you set up the DVD Sure, him? sure, sure. What we're going to see now is a, is, uh, is a little, tells the story of New York City Autobahn. It talks okay. about all of the kinds of work that we do to protect birds across New York City. Right. And uh, it gives a little taste of, of, of some of the the, the hands-on activity we do, some of the, the the work that volunteers do for the organization, and it kind of gives you a little inside glimpse into the lives of lives of birds here in New York City. Wonderful! They got a paragon. You say what, what do you call that? No, what do you call paragon? Peregrine, Peregrine falcons. Oh. It, wasn't there a thing, a red one or something? Or? Well, those red-tailed hawks. Red-tailed hawks. See, there was a big a, deal going on. And there in is. Central You'll see Park. a little bit about it. In okay. This part, well, so. maybe we let we'll the talk DVD more. talk for itself. Yeah. Okay. We're we're talking with Len Phillips, and let's see if we can set that up in the control room. I guess it runs about five six minutes or something like that. And we're talking against Len Phillips, okay? The concrete canyons of Manhattan. Great the mic. Here we see an island so densely packed with people who know nothing of wildlife, save the odd cockroach or pigeon. Get out of here, no wildlife. What do you mean, no wildlife? Nobody says my town ain't got wildlife. New York, New York, the town's so nice, they named it twice. Has got all kinds of wildlife, with fur, feathers, and fins, especially feathers. Hey, if you don't believe me, then maybe you'll believe these guys. They're my friends from New York City Audubon, your local Audubon chapter. Last year, they found more than 300 species of birds here in the Big Apple. Big ones, little ones, fast ones, slow ones. Why my friends at the New York City Audubon are looking for birds in every corner of the Big Apple. It's a fledgling, so you got the, the fledgling and the adult right here. Ten years ago, we made a complete and thorough census of the birds nesting in the park. And today, we're in the process of repeating that study to see what changes there are in the, in the number and kinds of birds that are using Central Park's natural areas for breeding territory. The census is a great idea. I think I improved my observational skills immensely, but my wife, quite honestly, is much, much better than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it flew out. I see it. Lots of us birds think New York is a great place to live. But a big city like this can be tough if you don't know where you're going. Buildings, glass, and reflections everywhere. 
but my buddies at the New York City Audubon are learning everything they can on how to make our town safer for us birds. Our volunteers go out in the streets and look for injured and dead birds and collect data, basically. They try to save as many injured birds as they can, and the birds that are dead are collected. Look at the blood in its beak. Poor little thing. Last fall, I found 44 birds. Birds were dropping next to me. Four of the 44, 33 were dead. It was very traumatic for them, certainly for me. Some folks at New York City Audubon have learned enough about these killer buildings to fill an entire book. We've been glazing buildings the same way for hundreds of years. And there are ways that we might be able to modify the patterns in the glass or reduce the reflectivity, embed some kind of patterns. You know, we feel that implementing a couple of key design uh, techniques would really make a tremendous difference. I'll say a tremendous difference. Ever since New York City Audubon helped modify these windows, this is no longer the notorious bird killer building of the West Side. Now, like a lot of New Yorkers, I love my convenient midtown location and skyline views. But there are those other birds that like to hang out on all those green spaces with the water views. And wouldn't you know it, there's my guys again. New York City Audubon keeping an eye on all of them out of borough birds. Urban habitat is an amazing place. There are so many areas where wildlife is abundant. New York City Audubon is leading some major research initiatives. We're looking at the productivity of the birds. I mean, the birds are nesting here, and that's a good sign. But we want to take it the next step. Are the birds, are they thriving? Boy, oh boy, these guys got their eyes on all the best nest real estate. From islands on the edge of the ocean to classy Fifth Avenue co-ops. New York City Audubon does more than just a little home repair for some famous red-tailed hawks. They're even helping the Parks Department figure out how to make lots of new land available for wildlife. Ridgewood Reservoir is a unique hidden treasure. Hundreds of thousands of people drive past this place every day with no idea of this miraculous little gem of nature hidden just behind the walls. And so one of the top five diamond species in this zone is this kind of moss. My guess is that the highest density of breeding is, is here and here. It's a great working relationship with the Parks Department. New York City Audubon's role is to provide advice and management information to the Parks Department so that they can make the most informed decisions about protecting the natural resources within the parks. On behalf of New York City Audubon's nearly 10,000 members, I strongly urge that funds be allocated to turn the former Ridgewood Reservoir into a destination for environmental education and a unique nature sanctuary. My friends at New York City Audubon are all over town, always educating folks about wildlife and wild places right in their own city. So we're going to be traveling under six different bridges. It's kind of interesting that you have a tremendous urban setting like this, and these birds have found these islands as their sanctuary. Boat rides, tours, all kinds of ways to let people know that they're living next to wildlife. The dark bird flying along with us next to the shore is a double-crested cormorant. In New York City in 1985, there were 20 pairs. Last summer, there were 1,700 pairs. On the sea, on land, or in the air, my friends at New York City Audubon are always keeping an eye on the wildlife in my favorite city. Beautiful. That's really good. You you should go into show business. Well, yeah, you're you know, quite a uh, interlocutor there. That's great. Yeah. Well, the, the birds really are the show at New York City. Yeah. You know, I think that, yeah, it's a, that yeah. there are a lot of great places to see birds in the city. That mm -hmm. I think you know Central Park is actually you know there's a Central book. Park's a wonder, isn't it? There's a there's a book that was published about 50 places to bird before you die. Mm. <laughs> New York is New York one. And, well, New York City not has has not just one. It has two of the 50 best places to no, bird in the world. And that's not that's not world. 
world. That's a country. In the world. In the world. In the world. 50. 50. Two of the 50, Two of the 50 are New, New York, York cities. City. One is Central Park. It is the best place Prospect to see. Prospect Park? Or? No, the other is Jamaica Bay. Jamaica and we saw some Bay. of that footage that was out uh -huh. in Jamaica Bay. It's Jamaica Bay is just in the shadow of John F. Kennedy Airport. Yeah. And it is the one of the most important places for birds in in the world. Isn't it's, that interesting? A, and the patterns are there for thousands of years. They have water, they have things, the monarch butterflies do the same. They come down, I know, and they follow a certain path. It's amazing. And the the, 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 the salmon go back to where they came from and the whales. Go, it's amazing the ecological patterns that are there. Well, in Jamaica Bay, it's, yeah. it's uh, one of the key species there are brant. Uh, brant. Brant. It's a kind of a goose. It's a little uh, smaller than a Canada goose. Uh -huh. and all of the brants mm -hmm. of this kind in the world mm -hmm. spend their winters either on the, the, the shore of Long Island mm -hmm. in Jamaica Bay mm -hmm. or along n the New Jersey shore. Oh, okay. Huh? All of them. There's only about 180,000 of them, which it's mm -hmm. not a small number. They're, we're not, they're not in danger of disappearing, but all 180,000 of them s depend on these, this one small area in the world for, uh -huh. their, for their wintering, and they all nest on two locations on Hudson Bay. Why couldn't they go somewhere else? Why well, couldn't they go down in South Dakota or something? Like if, you, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Why, well, if there's a lot, if there's a city there and they, aren't there waste, aren't there, um, w w you know, water, what do you call it? Um, what do you call that? Uh, you call it the, the, the near the sea. Um, estuaries? No, not estuaries. I think the, 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 you use the term, they had a cafe, a restaurant, a bar downtown called the, well, it'll come to me, I okay. forget the water, <laughs> water, wetland, wetlands, wetlands. they had the wetlands, wetlands. that's a very yeah, well, there are, there are wetlands but there all are over. wetlands all over and everything, why don't the birds go where the wetlands are and avoid the people, and what do we do with that, and that airplane got brought down, that he had to land in the yeah. Hudson, because these geese flew into the motor, and how do we deal with something like that, when they've got a, they got a, they got a right to do what they've been doing for thousands of years, and here we are. And do we have to adjust ourselves to the birds and their thing? And and why did they punish the birds? Well, let's. Why did they treat the birds so badly? They went and uh, they they killed off a lot of them for some they, reason. Well, they killed off some. I, I, mm -hmm. I think that the the it's a, that's a kind of a difficult and complicated story mm -hmm. because because. You know, they have nobody tenure. Wants, they have tenure on that territory. Uh, they do. They yeah. do. But nobody wants to but see. But they don't you know, have clout. I, I fly. Yeah. I, have you ever taken an airplane from the air, from JFK to yeah. some other place? Yeah, so, yeah. so there's. We would like to feel safe mm -hmm. when we're doing that. And flying, of course, yeah. flying is. There's inherently some risk in flying. Yeah. Now, luckily, mm -hmm. the risk in flying is actually on the scale of things quite small. That's right. Your chance of getting of being in a plane fly, accident is. is you know, you're, you're much more likely to die in a car accident than in a plane accident. Oh yeah, or be hit about, uh, like hitting by an, uh, a comet or something. You know, it's no, really it's. I think that well, probably the hitting by getting hit by a meteor is probably a little more unlikely I than so, yeah. than being yeah. in a plane accident. Yeah, but yeah. it's really, really incredibly yeah, yeah. unlikely. Yeah. In any from any cause, mm -hmm. plane accidents. You know, planes are pretty safe, but um, but having said that. There are there are some risks, and and collisions with birds are a major risk. Now, Can some of it is some of it is our own yeah. fault yeah. Uh, because so we built our airports. Because remember, I was saying earlier that that until recently we didn't value wetlands. Yeah, right. We didn't understand the important services that they provide. Just the, a swamp. The protection. It was just a swamp. So <laughs> yeah, fill it in. Right, yeah. What a great place! Mm. It's a it's a dirty old swamp. Who cares about it? Fill we it turn in it into and a, put an airport on and it. And put up a condominium. Um, and or, so or even yeah. So, yeah. Um, so all three airports in New York City and make money. So it had a lot to do with economics. Yeah, yeah go. Well, on. but all three airports. Mm. It's like nobody wants nobody wants an airport in their backyard. They're noisy. They're dangerous. They're, you know, but so you build them in a wetland because nobody cares about wetlands. Well, when you do that, we we lost sight of the fact that wetlands also happen to be home, not only just home to birds, right. but in particular home to some of the larger birds mm -hmm. like geese mm -hmm. that yeah. that also pose a risk to planes. Mm -hmm. And now that risk is small. Yeah. Um, the the birds that took down that flight were Canada geese. Uh huh. And. We know for absolute certain mm -hmm. that those geese molted in Newfoundland. 
Okay, that's a pattern that's well understood, yeah? Well, now, what we don't know is where the birds spent the rest of their time, mm -hmm. right? So Canada geese, historically, were our migratory birds. Okay, right? yeah, they I migrate, understand, yeah. They migrate you know, from the south up into Canada, and there's still those both birds that do that. Many, many years ago, over uh, in the 19th century, there were also resident Canada geese in the northeastern United States. Right. They were exterminated, extirpated. There is not a single one of those original wild Canada geese that would have been in New York. People hunting round. them for food? For hunting them for food or for fun or whatever. At, you know, mm. at that time, nobody thought there would that that wildlife could stop existing. They Everyone said there would be a pigeon too. There was one. Were, up here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the passenger okay. pigeon. Passenger pigeon. pigeon. Yeah. 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 So there were there were Canada geese that were resident here. Mm -hmm. In at the beginning of the 20th century, um, hunters mm -hmm. who who are the first conservationists, mm -hmm. they were the first people to put, and they're the, really the the only people who really put their money where their mouth is. Right? Bird watchers like me, we don't spend nearly as much on protecting birds as hunters do. Really, that's really. interesting. The hunters spend money, and to, and so they spent money to protect habitat and to, to to fund restoration efforts to bring the Canada goose back to New England. That's interesting. The hunter who's going to go out and kill them wants them to be there to allow exactly. them you can't, to kill them. You can't you can't well, hunt that, them if that, they're not there. There's an there. interesting metaphor, mixed no. uh, mixed messages there somewhere or something. Now, yeah. Somehow, yeah. in the process yeah. of restoring Canada mm -hmm. geese, they happened to choose. They were trying to find the what they thought would be the best match. And they chose the giant Canada goose. That's the, the largest form of Canada goose. Mm. Well, the they other big. Th they're yeah. big. They're mm. our, our resident Canada goose are big, much bigger than the migratory ones that come through, much bigger than the brant uh, that are a relative but uh, slightly different species. The, the giant Canada goose is big, mm. and it also matures really early. Mm -hmm. So most geese, it takes them at least two years to reach sexual maturity. Mm -hmm. Giant Canada geese, goose, one year. Hmm. So what that means is that rapid breeders. Exactly, huh? and well. urban areas. Of course, there's no hunting allowed in urban areas. It's too dangerous. We can't have hunters here in in Manhattan hunting Canada geese. Yeah, and so the population of Canada goose in New York City has mushroomed. Ah, so we we have probably between 25 and 30,000 Canada geese in New York City. Uh huh. That's a lot of geese, mm -hmm. and th and the more geese you have, the more risk there is for, for airplanes. Flights, yeah, and so not only big air airplanes, but small ones also. Uh, yeah. now, on top of that, mm -hmm. Canada geese. So there's there's a, there's a risk for airplanes, but they also because their numbers are so large, they mm -hmm. also have impact on other species. Right? Historically, that's right. Everything is connected. Right? Yeah. And his historically, that it may be have been. 300 years ago, that mm -hmm. 25, 30,000 Canada geese was a good number. But today, there's so much little of our wetlands left. Mm -hmm. There's so little left. Are you talking now in New York? Or are you New talking York City, the United I'm, States? Or I'm are you talking, talking New York World? City. I'm talking New York City. Okay. 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 I mean, all right. You're New York. In New York Audubon, State, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. In New York State, there are there are way more than 30,000 Canada geese. Yeah. I think there are there may be 250,000 Canada geese. Yeah. Close there's to a lot of land when you get out mm -hmm. into the country. Right. I mean, New York's unusual. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. the geese. And so so. You know. Do, do Canada geese have a right to live in New York City? Absolutely. Do shad have the right to live in the in the river rather than be in swimming around in sulfur polluted low water? Absolutely. So, which can be avoided yep. if we give it some thought. Yeah. So, so Canada geese do need to be protected in New York City. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do they need? Do, do we need to have twenty five or thirty thousand Canada geese in New York City? I don't know. I do don't we know have what a the process? Right All right. How do we deal with that? Being the conscious creatures who can do planning and so forth, there is a term called in in uh, animal husband. No, in an they have a thing called culling. Mm -hmm. That's a term that evolves to wi wildlife, and yeah. that. And then in, in horticulture, they have a thing called pruning. Oh. And then another thing I'd like to sort of lay on that pattern is, do we have a good understanding? of how many species there have been in the history of life on this planet, how many of the species that have existed are extinct, how many can we expect to go extinct, is it a natural process for species to go extinct, and when we say these species are going, is that something that is inherent and we can't guard against it, or nature itself, or the evolutionary process uh, accounts for 
uh, speciation, new appearance of speciation, punctuated equilibrium, you get new species. Uh, these are, how do we deal with these kind of questions? They're big questions. I think mm. that, that Maybe it's not most, fair to ask. But yeah. most research suggests that the current extinction rate is significantly higher than it's been you know, at any point since the, um, you know, the end of the age of dinosaurs. Uh, 65 million years ago. Yeah. That was a big extinction. That was yeah. a big extinction rate. Yeah. So yes, there are, there are far more. There was another one they got within about 3% uh, of life itself. Right, so that was yeah. a big extinction. And, yeah. and I think that there are, there are some natural causes. Who claim, who yeah. consider that, that, there was that, obviously. that humans are you know, the third wave of extinctions and that we are causing. There are people who think that there way. There are people that who think it, that way. It's a blight upon the world. Well, I, there are people who think that way. But, and that nature is so gloriously wonderful. And there are people who believe in ecology like green and organic. There's something wonderful about organic. The pollution comes from human beings using chemicals and all kinds of things that are created in the laboratory. They're not part of nature, as though nature is a wonderful well, thing. There are other people problem who in think New York nature. City. No, if I may, the other thing is that they think of nature as just very cruel. If you're a, an antelope in the mouth of a leopard, that's part of the natural process, but if you're the antelope, it doesn't seem particularly <laughs> anything other than very brutal and nasty, brutish and short, as they say. So nature isn't uh, all beautiful and wonderful. We look at some tableau, there is a lot of destruction, there's a lot of killing, there's a lot of terrible struggle, desperate struggle between creatures to survive. It isn't some beautiful, beautiful template, you know, beautiful, Whitman sampler thing of no. chocolates, you know. No, no na nature, it's nature is You want to rise up. There are people who say that humanity was put here to rise above nature. And there's that attitude in the technological development, and they say, why do we worry about the wetlands? We can build, and you've never made a profit out of a wetland. I can make a profit by building a condominium there and build a golf course and fill it in, and I can make money and build profit and benefit human society. And, and so how do you address all well, that? And without and that wetland, gonna, without and without that wetland, the next hurricane will completely wipe out your your all that investment. So and you'll you have to build all over again. Okay, so that's good. Now you think you build a great Katrina. big castle, it falls into the swamp, right. and then you well, build another great big castle on top of it. Okay, uh, Katrina came, and they didn't have yep. enough levees. You have a levee. Should we not have levees? Should we not have protection? Should we not have houses? Houses is a protection against nature. Why don't we just stand out there and let the mother nature bring down snow and everything? We build a protection against the the voraciousness of nature, not the wonderful, wonderful, soothing not nature. Uh, there, it's it's red in tooth and claw. The evolutionary process and species are being disappeared all the time, and has been. It's necessary that they are. So why are we worrying about a couple of bird species being? Uh, eliminated through the necessity of providing for human need and so forth, if we're all going to have to live in some brutish thing in sync with nature. I mean, that's the way a lot of people think. Well, I think that if it were human, if it were real true necessity, mm. I might agree with you, but I don't believe it's necessity. Okay. I believe it's vanity. Okay. That, it, that for, mere, for, for mere vanity, <laughs> it is, who are we to decide that that the peregrine falcons can't be on this planet? Who are we to decide that bald eagles can't be on this planet? Peregrine, vulture, uh, peregrine has no ability to have a decision in that, but we do. Exactly. Because we have a, a steward's responsibility for mm -hmm. it. And what comes down to wh which species is going to survive? Survival of the species, the survival of the fittest, said Mr. Darwin. Well, and I think or that it fittest is, in the biggest sense of the term. And I think it is it, that we owe our children and grandchildren mm -hmm. and great-grandchildren and their grandchildren children mm -hmm. to have made the, the wisest decisions that we can to give to, to allow the choices to be made as late as possible because we don't know that you know that mm -hmm. the descendants of the salt marsh sparrows in Jamaica yeah. Bay uh -huh. which are threatened with development and global warming and sea level rise as the, yeah. as, as those last salt marshes disappear right. th their descendants may be you know, the next sentient beings mm. in 10 million years from now, who knows? Boy, I asked you to go a thousand years, you're going 10 million, that's uh, a lot. Know. That's a big long template like that and everything to do. But I think that's, the, yeah. as humans, we're capable right. of thinking beyond mm -hmm. just our own needs for today. I mean, it is encouraging, isn't it, that there's a sense of uh, uh, appropriate, uh, a sense of ecology becoming popular within the overall world society. The, uh, you know, thing about, and being a, the green movement, as mm -hmm. you put it that way, so we could use non-polluting 
co non-polluting fuels and that sort of thing, and have a sense of green. It's a sense of, um, it's a sense of ecological responsibility, and also the idea of Gaia, the idea that the, the Earth, the life form on this Earth, it's all one system, and we're all interconnected. The, the whole of the environment is interconnected. Is, is, it, it, the, the separations are all artificial in a way because it's all one system. So it's a sense of stewardship, particularly as we have the ability to engineer maybe things that will not rape the planet in order for us to have a reasonable way of living amongst ourselves and our own species. You know, basically, maybe, from, yeah. the, from the Gaia maybe hypothesis, a, um, yeah, go on. from the Gaia hypothesis, yeah. you could think about people on planet Earth mm -hmm. you know, that, that if we screw things up so that the planet can't function, right? We will go extinct. Well, and then whatever left, the, the cockroaches and the pigeons and the house mice and the rats uh -huh. that, that, that we can't seem to do anything about, mm -hmm. um, much as we've tried, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, they will you know, repopulate this planet with new species. So you mm -hmm. know, there will, there, you know, the, it may be that if, if we can't get it right, mm -hmm. if we can't create a future that that is sustainable. Work, that's sustainable uh, for us and all of it. Uh, yeah. Then, then some other group of organisms will get a chance to do it. Well, that's the way our evolution's worked, hasn't yeah. it? There have been many dead ends. Most of the species that have existed are extinct. Yeah. I believe that's right. Yes, do you have a, from your studies and everything? Do you have any idea what of the of the species that have existed, best we can measure through time? What what uh, we're all survivors. That's one thing. We're all survivors. Yep. We're fit. We've we're survived. Fit. We're to here this now. Point. Right. We're here now, <laughs> and so right. is the bird. Yep. But I mean, we don't know how many there are. But and it, I don't think we've ever been in a position where there was any creature that could, like we can now, apparently through weapons, perhaps destroy our entire species, which I hear from some modeling, that is what the weapons amount to now, existential new reality. We can obliterate our species with the weapons if they're unleashed as we've been doing. That's existential yeah. new. But I don't think that's, I, don't, I think there are lots of other ways. I, think, I actually think that the, our weapons are, the, are probably the least likely way in which we will eliminate our species. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, How I, might we do it? Through ecological disasters? I think ecological disasters. You think so? Global warming's that bad or something? Well, between global warming and, and all of, I mean, the, you know, every time we turn around, we're, we're looking at a new way to tinker with our environment to well, try and make it Well, that's part of our ingenuity. Better. That's part of and, our ingenuity. Right. So, we, so, so if we do that in a, in a wise way, mm -hmm. I mean, we won't really know until, until we've done it wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it'll be too late when we, when we make a mistake that, that's, that's not I don't fixable. think there's any other way we could uh, wipe out the species except through, uh, through uh, weapons. Well, I think it would we happen in an eye blink. It would yeah. happen all at once. It wouldn't happen. I don't think there would be people survive in New Guinea. It's a big planet if we're just doing the ecological things. But maybe one of the problems is we ought to all have a sense of ecology. And yeah. the Audubon Society, or the Audubon, New York Audubon, is in good hands with you, Glenn. Yep. Thank you very it's much for coming. To talk to Your you. pleasure. The perceptions in um, of um, Glenn Phillips. He's the executive director of New York Audubon, talking about ecology. Congratulations on being in such a responsible position for helping and preserve the wetlands and the sense of ecology, and we all need that. And I think it's really good if we get a sense of the, that we're all interconnected in the, in the system, and I think it's beginning to dawn more widely, so a sense of stewardship and responsibility for the whole system rather than just one group within the system, like say human beings, yeah. that is responsible, and that goes into the plant life and everything and the algae and that. So anyway, thank you for uh, carrying that forward and doing it, and thanks for the uh, coming in talking about uh, these issues on the program. Sorry, it's too short. We no. could talk for hours. We could keep talking for We're going to have to meet again like Indeed. This. Okay. Thank you for viewing. Your pleasure to have his perceptions, and um, thanks again, Glenn, very, very much for coming.